Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Deep Space Spatiotemporal Insights into COVID-19, a Multi-Organ Study. This webinar is part of the Labroots Coronavirus Virtual Event Series. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. My name is Elizabeth Schneider, Senior Global Marketing Manager here at Nanostring. Of course, today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots, sponsored by those of us at Nanostring. For more information about Nanostring and our products and technologies, please go to our website. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using the new live chat feature during the presentation. You can find the live chat located at the right of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. And don't fret if we don't get to your question, we will be collecting all the questions and follow up individually with those of you whose questions weren't answered during the live Q&A. Um, and uh, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the help desk button located at the bottom of your screen within the navigation bar or from the lobby of the event. Finally, as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credit. Click on the continuing education credits link located in the abstract window below the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credit. I now present um, today's speaker, Dr. Arusa Kulasinga. He's an NHMRC research fellow at the University of Queensland. And he leads the clinical omics lab at the University of Queensland. And Dr. Kulasinga has pioneered spatial transcriptomics using digital spatial profiling approaches in the Asia Pacific region, contributing to world's first studies on lung cancer, head and neck cancer, and COVID-19. His research aims to understand the underlying pathobiology by using an integrative multiomics approach. He's published his research in 50 manuscripts, likely more than 50 by now. And he supported, in addition um, to the NHMRC by AAS, Cure Cancer, MRFF, and numerous philanthropic and hospital foundations. Thank you so much, Arutha, for joining us for this interesting talk. And thanks, everyone, for being on the line to listen to your presentation today. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Elizabeth. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. And thank you, Labroots, for the um, invitation to talk about some of our really exciting work in, in, in COVID-19. Um, this all stemmed a couple of years ago where we, you know, through an extensive collaboration, we've been able to access really rare samples. And uh, we've done a deep dive using spatial biology. So I'm based in Brisbane, Australia. That's a map of Australia you can see there. And um, I'll tell you a bit about our sort of exciting work we've been doing over the last uh, couple of years and, and what it's led to. Um, the talk's titled Deep Spatiotemporal Insights into COVID-19, a multi-organ study, and I've acknowledged a number of uh, funding agencies. So uh, what you see here is a map of Australia, and on the right, um, is it, it looks like a Bronoi plot, which we use for spatial sort of interactions, but it's actually the indigenous communities within Australia. So, you know, it all goes back and it's all connected. So it is, it's a really nice depiction of, of, of you know, how this is, um, you know, this sort of segues into this work. So this work really um, began from this um, study that was published in the New England uh, in, in April 2020, which looked at bulk genomic assessments um, of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 infected lungs and compared it to um, H1N1, pandemic H1N1. And one of the takeaway messages from this was that there was this, um, this, this Venn diagram which showed differentially expressed genes, but also genes that were shared between COVID-19 and, and H1N1. And it really piqued our interest as to whether we could apply the methods that we developed in the lab using spatial approaches to really try to delineate what was going on in the, um, in the tissues of, of, of COVID-19. Uh, uh, studies. So um, one of the approaches we've used and one of the technologies we've used is, is this digital spatial profiling from nanostring technologies, which essentially allows you to take a single unstained FFPE tissue section. So that's the biggest um, benefit of this technology that you can, you can use samples that are archival, that are in pathology banks, that are shipped at room temperature around the world. And we've been able, we were we were lucky enough to access some of this material, and and you can essentially take an unstained tissue section, 
you can define your regions of interest within that and you can liberate the, um, the, the transcript or the protein data of that tissue using these tiny uh, mirrors which shine UV light uh, above the regions of interest and it liberates these oligo tags uh, for the cleavable linkers which are then um, deposited in a, in a 96 well plate and you get uh, counts per region of interest, so digital expression data per region of interest within that tissue. And the beauty of this technology is really in that you know you can do it off a single unstained tissue section. And and some recent data that was shown at ACR was that you could do protein and RNA off a single section, which is uh, really exciting because as what we've traditionally done is we go through uh, serial sections to do protein, but now that you are able to do it off the same tissue section, is really really powerful. Um, so I'll talk about some of the, the, the work that, that, that led to this. So we, we had, um, through extensive collaboration through Curitiba in Brazil, we had access to COVID-19 uh, lung autopsy samples. These were prepared into a tissue microarray block, um, 10 samples in, in 10 patient samples in the COVID-19 block, 10 H1N1. This was the 2009 pandemic and Tomo non-viral uh, non death uh, control samples. So we, Essentially, uh, H&E stained these, ran Mason's trichome for fibrosis, IHC for the spike protein, RNA scope for the virus, Tempris 2, ACE2. And at the time, sort of August 2020, um, where we didn't really have any cases in Australia, um, which was, we were lucky as a country, uh, we had pathologists that were invested in the literature and, and they collaborated with us to actually characterize these tissues, even though they'd never seen uh, COVID-19 autopsy samples at that time. Um, so Caroline Cooper was, was collaborated with us from the PA hospital, and we ran the nanostring geomics DSP COVID-19 immune atlas panel, which was what was the panel that was available at that time in, 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 in August 2020, which is uh, a, a panel developed over the cancer transcriptome atlas panel with about 50 spiking COVID spiking uh, uh, genes. And since then, we've run the whole transcriptome, which is 18,000 flex, which allows you to do a deep dive on the cell typing and and and, and so on. And the bioinformatics was, was handled through the uh, Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, uh, specifically from Melissa Davies' lab, uh, Chin Wee Tang, a number of collaborators from there. And this is just going through those uh, tissue samples showing the virus in the red um, by RNA scope. And what we did following the discovery approach with the tissue is we went on to test, um, and I'll talk briefly about this, uh, test some of the gene signatures and some of the genes that were differentially expressed in, in blood and nasal swab samples from about a thousand patients, uh, a cross-sectional multi-institute study um, pre-Omicron uh, where case numbers weren't as high, and we validated these findings in prospective studies. So, the study really focused on the lungs, but we've extended this out to cardiac, placenta, uh, and brain studies um, in, in, in this workflow. So this is now going through those um, tissue samples in the lungs. So we're able to identify the majority cell types within the lung tissues by uh, defining regions of interest. So we're able to identify the hyaline membranes, the type 2 pneumocytes, the bronchiopithelial cells. So you can see, you can almost, it's the, the, the most similar um, sort of way of characterizing these is, is, is sort of laser capture micro, uh, uh, micro dissection. So you can almost define these regions of interest. So you can see in this bronchiophilial layer, you can almost shadow over that and you can liberate the transcript of the protein data straight off that uh, using those tiny uh, mirrors and, and, and the UV light. So we were able to define the majority cell types for these regions of interest. Um, this is now just toggling through, looking at the virus in the red. Um, and these are, you know, representative regions of interest within that tissue. And this is on the whole transcriptome data when we're looking at cell typing. So this is a cell de deconvolution map where we can see the COVID going across in the red and the normal in the blue and the different cell types within those regions of interest. And we were, we were really interested in the subsets of immune cells and we did an immune cell decon over these. So now this is getting a, a further sort of uh, layer of data on the on the immune cell subtypes, and you can see the cell types on the right there. Again, the red going across is the COVID samples, and the blue um, is the non-COVID or the or the normal tissue samples. And when we go on to the PCA, so the dimension reduction analysis, this is a helicopter overview of your transcript data. If you focus on the figure on the right, you can see the COVID-19 samples in the blue. Um, the H1N1 samples in the red and the normal healthy uh, control samples in the yellow. So you've got these two sort of populations 
present in this cohort. Again, this is transcript data, global overview, um, and then focus on the figure on the right. We now overlay that with the cores where, we, we, where each color represents an individual patient. So again, transcript data where each color represents a patient. You still got these two populations which weren't really clear to us what this was. So then we overlaid the, the majority cell type pathology assessment over the transcriptome data. And what we could see was that the PCA on the PCA plot, the cell types separated out the transcript level data. So you could see the bronchiopithelial cells at the bottom right, the hyaline membrane in the yellow, um, the, the, the type two pneumocytes in the light blue, and so on. So it really shows you the power of integrating um, spatial RNA data with that majority cell type assessment or the pathology assessment essentially, and how those two data sets really come together. Um, we then went on to look at differentially expressed genes between COVID-19 versus control and H1N1. And one of the top differentially expressed genes that were highly upregulated in COVID-19 was um, these um, type 1 interferon response genes, specifically IFI27, came up in multiple data sets and in orthogonal data sets for us uh, in tissue. And luckily on the call, we had Kirsty Short, Short, who's a leading virologist in the country, and um, she almost shrieked on the Zoom call, which is incredible, um, because it's been known that IFI27 was elevated in the blood of COVID-19 patients, but they hadn't tied that to the tissue finding. So this was one of the earliest studies showing uh, where the signal was coming from in the tissue. And we, we then went on to look at the viral load. Again, your type 1 interferon response comes up. This is looking at high virus versus low virus by RNA scope. Um, and then um, low viral load as well. And, and, and we've done some gene enrichment analysis, and you can see the pathways that are activated here. So interferon gamma, a blood coagulation, hypoxia, uh, interferon alpha, um, again, and we've got the water pole plots here to map back to this. And what was really unique from our study was that when we compared our, um, the differentially expressed genes that were found in our study versus those that were publicly available at the time, there appeared to be a very unique signature for COVID-19, which included IFI27 in there. And we've since published this study in the European Respiratory Journal, which came out late last year. And it really showed the, you know, the power of, of spatial to really inform on, on, on discovery type approaches for biomarkers potentially. Um, so I'll now sort of transition into, you know, we've, we've done that whole fly tissue um, assessment and we're moving towards that single cell subcellular um, assessment. And we were able to, um, collaborate with Nanostring on, a, on, a, on their new um, cosmic subcellular technology, which really enables you to do a deep dive on the individual cell types and subcellular assessments. So this is the cosmic uh, platform where we looked at about a thousand transcripts per cell, again, on a, on a, on a new uh, TMA where we had 20 patient samples, um, again, lungs um, in duplicate, both biological and te technical uh, replicates and we had control lung tissue as well as a comparator and the fields of view on the cosmic platform are what are sh what are uh, demarcated in these yellow sort of compartments and each in within each compartment you can capture about 50,000 individual cells at a thousand transcripts per cell level and this is just looking at a sort of an overview of that and you can see the broad structures within that so the RNA is on the right the proteins on the left and we were able to do a deep dive where every dot here represents a transcript in these samples. And what we wanted to do was to compare across these. So our first step was to look at the RNA scope to localize where the virus was, um, in the cell types where the virus was infecting. And you can see very clearly that you've got a sort of a heterogeneous uh, sort of expression level of, of RNA scope, which is expected across the individual um, patient samples. <coughs> Excuse me. And what you can see is that the RNA scope uh, highlights the SARS-CoV-2 in the red, and you've got your composite immunofluorescence image in the middle, which is based on pancytokeratin CD45 and CD3. And then on the right, that's transcript level data that you're looking at, the single uh, molecule uh, transcript level data that you're looking at. If we zoom in on this, you can see the RNA scope um, is, is really tagging this almost this boundary on, 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 on the bottom here. And what, what we can do is we can identify the different cell types within there, but we can now, if you focus on the figure on the, on the right, this is looking at IFI27 in the red, CXCL10 in the yellow, and CD31 in the purple, but this is single transcript level information. So every dot there represents a single transcript. 
When we then look at the clustering and the data normalization, this is now plotting every cell position on the tissue microarray. We're then able to uh, QC and, and filter the data, and we can see the COVID samples in the blue, the, the control in the red, and, and, and good separation of the two. And when we normalize these data, we can see the two sort of uh, populations separate out really well here um, in, in our data set. And when we go into the unsupervised clustering and the data normalization from that um, to infer cell type information, we can see um, this is now plotting the different cell types within that population within the COVID and the control sample. And what was really notable in the study was that we could see that this box here in the red is, is highlights the COVID samples and the controls are, are, are the two um, bars on the right so that we can see good, good clustering of the, of the COVID from the normal um, and, and, and the different cell populations with, within that. And we're actually at the moment trying to, to, to do a deep dive on the different cell types within that. And I'll just touch on some of the initial analysis on the subcellular assessment um, study where we're looking at the spatial map um, here on the, on the top left and the different cell types, uh, which are some of which are uh, labeled here. When we look at the macrophage component of these, we can now compare between um, COVID um, positive samples versus control samples. And we can see in the macrophage component, IFI 27 is highly upregulated um, or differentially expressed in, 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 this, in, this, in, this, in this study um, between the uh, COVID versus the control lung tissue. But we can also see that in the high virus infected samples by RNA scope versus the COVID positive samples where we're not picking up virus, but we can see again, IFI 27 is one of those top differentially expressed genes and it appears to be um, localizing to this macrophage com uh, compartment. So we're, we're doing a lot more work um, in this space, which is really exciting, but it's, it's really showing you, you know, you do the gene discovery work with or the signature work with the DSP Geomics up front, and then you can do a real deep dive on the on the on the individual cells and subcellular using the um, Cosmics platform. So IFI 27 was one of those key genes that we wanted to investigate in the blood and the nasal samples of of of, of um, COVID-19 patients. And what we did in a in a retrospective and a prospective study across the globe, almost so in Brazil, Chile, the U.S. Um, Singapore, Australia, and Denmark, we looked at about uh, 800 patients and about 108 controlled pre-Omicron at IFI 27 levels in the blood and the nasal swabs within the first few days of symptom onset. Um, and we could show that IFI 27 alone was a predictor for disease severity when measured within the first few days of symptom onset. And this was IFI 27 specifically in the blood. And uh, we had, a, you could see in a stepwise manner that severe patients, patients that developed severe COVID-19 symptoms within the, when, when you measured IFI 27 in the blood and not the nasal swabs within the first few days, um, it predicted for disease severity. So those patients that went on to, 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 to uh, ICU and those that didn't. And this is just looking at an Australian cohort where we can show that IFI 27 outperforms other clinical assessments such as lymphopenia, CRP, age, comorbidities, and symptom score. I'll quickly touch on some of the really exciting work in the cardiac space. So this is looking at COVID-19 cardiac tissue versus control. And what was really notable in the study, we looked at 10 patients, uh, um, 10 patients uh, from, from um, COVID-19 positive uh, uh, patients, H1, N1, and control uh, cardiac tissue. And we, we, this is just looking at the differentially expressed uh, genes. And we, when we look at the, um, genes that are upregulated in COVID versus H1N1. So this is a, 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 a map showing um, what are the, what are the, what are the uh, genes that enrichment uh, scores um, for COVID versus uh, H1N1. We can see a DNA damage signature is really high in the COVID-19 population and it is downregulated in H1N1. But when we look at H1N1, we can see that the inflammatory sort of ISGs or your interferons are upregulated in, in influenza, but they are downregulated in, in the cardiac tissue of COVID-19. So uh, it, it, the study really shows the differences in, in cardiac tissue um, from SARS-CoV-2 infection and H1N1, um, and we've got a, a preprint out on this work currently. And I'll quickly touch on the placental COVID-19 study where we looked at about 10 um, COVID-19 third trimester positive, uh, COVID-19 positive uh, placentas versus 
gestational age match controls. And what was really interesting in the study was we could identify uh, a preeclampsia signature, which was specific to the COVID-19 patients. Um, and again, it, it really shows that extra pulmonary effect um, of COVID-19 and, and why so much work needs to be done um, looking at the long-term effects of COVID-19. And this is a really, you know, an early study, but it really shows you the power of spatial to really understand what's going on in these tissues where you can often not find virus. So we couldn't find virus by RNA scope in, in the placenta or the myocardial tissue. It is It was very much located to the lungs of these patients, um, but there are these extra pulmonary effects. Um, with that, I'd like to thank all the collaborators on this study, um, namely Fernando Gumarez, Kirsty Short, Gabriel Bell, Melissa Davies, and her team, a wonderful team at the Walton Eliza Hall, uh, John Fraser and his lab. And, and we've got a number of papers out in this space and, and a few more to come. Um, and the patients that have contributed their valuable samples to this study and the funding agencies. Thank you. I welcome any questions. All right, everyone, thanks for listening to that presentation. So we have Arutha here for the live Q&A portion of the webinar. So please go ahead and put your questions into the question window so we can get started with some Q&A. Um, there is one question for you, Arutha. Did you check if your virus detection spots also have ACE2 expressors? And if not, what is the entry port on the cellular surface? Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, that's a great question. We, so with the RNA scope, we found it challenging in that initially we ran the SARS-CoV-2 and when we could see a very punctate sort of pattern in it, we couldn't resolve that further. Uh, we are currently looking at ACE2 um, expression as well. So it's a, it's a good sort of uh, thing that we're dealing at, at the lab, um, but I don't have a response at this stage. Um, the only thing we looked for by RNA scope, by RNA scope was, was the virus itself. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, let me see if we have any additional questions. Um, so, I have a question for you, Arutha. Um, so, now that, um, you know, uh, Nanostring has presented at AACR this spatial proteogenomics workflow for looking at RNA and protein simultaneously, are you thinking about doing that for any upcoming experiments? Yeah, absolutely. So that was, uh, uh, I think, a really important uh, finding because typically we would go through um, a block to do RNA and protein, but being able to do that sort of multi-omic assessment of a single tissue section is really powerful. So we're looking to adopt that workflow um, pretty quickly. Um, so we, we were really excited. It was the first time we'd seen that um, the poster being presented at ACR. So I think that sort of, you know, directionally, that's what everyone wants because as you move through through a block, um, you are moving through cells and, and potentially not even the same plane. So being able to get that simultaneous protein and RNA readout is important of the same section. So it's great that that's been developed um, and that we can apply that workflow. And it looked like it was a pretty standard workflow um, that we could adopt. So we're really keen to now use that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Let me see if we have any other questions that have come in. So another question, um, you know, what, what's next for you guys in terms of the COVID-19 studies? Yeah, so we, we've, we're doing a deep dive on the cosmics at the moment. So that's been really insightful. Um, there's a, the, the data is quite, you know, it's data heavy um, at this stage. So we did the, you know, the signature work with the geomics up front. And now we're sort of doing a deep dive on the single cell subcellular workflow using the cosmic technology. And from initial, you know, I showed a bit of data um, today. Um, the initial findings are really promising um, around around the, you know, the cellular localization, the cell cell interactions. But I think there's an additional layer when you start to look at transcripts, transcripts in space, and you know, the the transcript interactions and and, and so on. So. We're excited by the cosmics, but I think it's a very data heavy um, approach, but but it's great, right? It, it, it's got a lot of um, sort of discovery uh, tools there that we can develop. So we're, we're doing a deep dive on the cosmics at the moment and the cosmics data. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, another question, um, one of the theories of long COVID is that some SARS-related lesions 
there are some SARS-related lesions in peripheral tissues, um, which actually point on extra lung virus. I don't know if that's a question or just a, a statement for you to comment on. Sorry, Elizabeth, could you repeat that? I didn't get the full question. Um, it says one of the theories of long COVID is that there are some SARS-related lesions in peripheral tissues, which actually points to having extra virus in the lungs. Right. Um, so we've we've looked at we've looked at a sort of multi-organ study um, in matched patients too, where we looked at the lungs, cardiac, brain, placenta, uh, tissue, and we could only localize virus to by RNA scope to the to the lungs. We did see extra pulmonary effects, um, mostly inflammatory. Um, we've got a uh, an early preprint on the cardiac study where we've identified DNA damage in, in, in COVID-19 cardiac tissues, which is very different to H1N1, which elicits an inflammatory response, whereas in, in COVID, it's a DNA damage response that we're seeing. Um, it, we, we aren't able to find virus um, in, in, in the placenta, nor the brain, nor the, nor the cardiac tissue. So um, I think that peripheral sort of extra pulmonary organ studies are going to be critical to understand the impact um, of, of, of long COVID. Um, I'd, I'd love to share some of the brain data, but it's brand new, and then hopefully we'll be able to get that out soon. Um, it's, it's, you know, there are changes we're seeing in, the, in, in, in COVID-19 brain tissues as well. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, there's so much unknown, but using these discovery tools, and you know, good cohorts will be able to um, identify, hopefully, um, you know, new insights into the disease biology and hopefully the long-term impact of COVID. Great. And uh, a question I actually have: um, you mentioned that you're going to be looking at um, some of the tissues of Cosmix. Um, do you envision um, in the future sort of using genomics to do um, sort of at the whole transcriptome level? Um, you know, a discovery type experiment, um, and then for the tissue samples that are of most of interest, then diving deeper into, say, a serial section with Cosmix to look at the single cell level. Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there, um, Elizabeth. Um, you know, the, the geomics is tied throughput. You know, we can run multiple samples a day on that. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to run, let's say, 50 samples, you could do that within, you know, a couple of days with it, with the geomics. And then, Based on your findings, you could then narrow that down to a subset of samples that you want to do a deep dive on and get that sort of single cell um, interaction work and then do the cosmics on that. So I think the geomics up front for the discovery would be key. Um, and then cosmics where you really narrow it down. Um, I, I guess you could do it the other, you know, you could go cosmics up front, but you probably wouldn't have that throughput that's needed. Um, and then the, you know, the the end numbers. So I, I, I'd highly recommend uh, geomics up front, um, at least to identify, you know, signatures of importance for your disease model, and then to to, to then go into the cosmic workflow. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, another question, um, for any of the lung samples that you looked at, did any of those um, um, decedents um, have any comorbidities associated with, um, with uh, their treatment or with their condition? Yeah, no, there were so so obviously these are all rapid autopsy samples, so they are they are end stage, um, which you know it's hard to get lung tissue from um, earlier um, cases. So we there are multiple comorbidities even in the in the lung and the cardiac studies. Um, there are sort of um, analyses we're looking at in that in that space. Um, so yeah, definitely a few uh, confounding factors there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, um, this is your last chance to get in some questions. Um, and Ar Arutha is very kindly dialing in for us all the way from Australia. So um, take advantage of the time that you have with him. Um, he was actually presented um, for um, the Lab Roots Coronavirus event um, on an earlier um, virtual event that we had last year. Um, and he's also done a lot of work with the genomics um, looking at um, immune infiltration and in cancer. So. Um, he's really well versed in that space of studying the immune microenvironment, both in cancer and infectious disease. So, if you have any additional questions, um, now's your chance to get them out. Yeah, absolutely. It's been such a powerful tool in the IO space. Um, obviously, you know, your, your traditional um, checkpoint inhibitor therapies don't have good predictive biomarkers at the moment. So, we've used We've done a deep dive on the tumor microenvironment, um, 
and there's some real novel insights that we're gaining. So it's, it's definitely a tool that you can use pan disease model, um, especially if you're interested in discovery type work. Excellent. Thank you so much, Arutha. So this concludes the live Q&A portion of today's webinar. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. And thank you again, Arutha, for your time. Thank you, Elizabeth.